You play a good game, boy, but the game is over. Welcome back to Matt's Movie Nights, where I recommend movies and we talk about them. But you can't guess which movie I recommended last time. I mean, I guess it's in the title of the video and you already saw the intro. But, uh, it's Phantasm. Ooh. So, I, I want to start by showing you how much of a pain in the ass it is to get the Blu-rays out of here. Right? So, you, you open it from the top. And first you've got this whole little, like, stand set up for, for the ball. And it helps if you take the ball out. But you gotta take some of the top off so you can get the ball out. So you can take the rest of it out. Set that right there. And then, down here in the bottom is where the Blu-rays are, but they're sorta... There, there is a little hole, which makes it easier, but they, they get real stuck up in there. But uh, then, then you have the Phantasm collection. Under all of that, you have to take all the other stuff out before you can get to the Blu-rays. Uh, last time, because it's summer, we did an ice cream horror triple feature, and we started with the ever-classic Phantasm. Uh, because it features Reggie, the ice cream man, as a, as a major protagonist. He becomes more of the protagonist as the series goes on, but he is he is very present in this first film. And and it ties into the story, because the cold man is... Uh, and it ties into the story because the tall man is affected by cold, so, like, like he's hurt by the cold. So, you know, Reggie the Ice Cream Man coming to save the day with his cold car. Not to be confused with his cool car, which uh, is on the top of the stand here. This nice mid-70s Hemi Cuda. Um, I think it's actually a different Hemi Cuda in every movie, because um, he wrecks it in the second one. It doesn't make sense. Why does an ice cream man have a super nice sports car like this? The world may never know. I think actually in the first movie, it's uh, Mike and his brothers. I don't remember his brother's name. But it's it's Mike and his brothers, Himikuda, and then uh, Reggie just takes it in the other movies. Because... Mike's not old enough to drive, and his brother's dead, so it's like, well, guess this is my Hemi Cuda now. Can't blame him, it's a cool-ass car. So, Phantasm is a movie I fucking love. Obviously. I, I keep this, you know, right here on my shelf behind me. So it's it's in... It's been in a lot of the videos since the beginning of the year. This is relatively new. I've only had this a couple months. Um, and it's also the easiest way to get the complete Phantasm collection on Blu-ray, because it's actually pretty difficult to get Phantasm 1 and 2 on Blu-ray. For some reason, the first two are hard. After that, like 3, 4, and 5, very easy to find on Blu-ray, but 1 and 2, not so much. But, uh, I got them in a nice box set, so I'm, I'm real happy about that. Yeah, I really like this movie, which is a little odd, because the first time I saw Phantasm, I didn't like it that much. Um, I think I, just, I, I didn't really get it the first time I saw it, because it's, it's a really weird and aggressive movie. Uh, so I, I completely understand anyone who like, on a first watch, is like, wow, I, I didn't really like that. Because it is, it is real fucking weird. It is, it's surreal. It's a surrealist horror film. And it, it's a little hard to deal with, because there's, there's, like, weird sci-fi lore to it. Um, that, uh, I mean, to be fair, that I don't fully understand... After watching all five of these movies, I don't fully understand the sci-fi lore. Although it's a, it's a little simpler in the first one. It's just, uh, 
there's this tall man who works in a, a mortuary and he uh he's he steals the bodies and then compresses them into dwarf zombies and then sends the dwarf zombies to his home planet to be slaves. Sure, makes sense. I mean, I mean, I can tell you exactly what happens. I can't exactly explain why, but I don't, you know, it's like weird alien shit. Who cares why? It's happening. And uh that's that's kind of the vibe of the Phantasm franchise. It's like who cares why it's happening? It's Phantasm. Just go with it. This is uh this is this is a, a stoner horror movie. I <laughs> Phantasm 1 is the only one of these I have watched sober. The other four I watched stoned off my ass. Which is exactly how you should watch the sequels. <laughs> and Phantasm 1, to be fair, like, if you can swing it, get stoned before you watch this. Um, but I mean, you know, I like it enough that I would also recommend you watch it sober. Yeah, uh, tall man on Earth stealing all these bodies, and he he kills... Like, Reggie and Mike's older brother. God damn, what is his older brother's name? I feel like that's important. Jody. Okay, his brother's name's Jody. Thank you, Phantasm Booklet. Um, yeah, Reggie and Jody's friend, like, gets murdered by the tall man because the tall man can, like, transform into a hot woman. A power he uses in this film and only this film. He he turns into a hot woman and then he he has sex with uh, Mike and Jody's friend and then murders him. And so, you know, they're at the funeral and uh, Mike sees uh, the tall man steal the body and he's trying to convince... Jody and Reggie to, like, help him and, like, there's something weird with the, the mortician... Uh, and at first they don't believe him, but then, like, weird shit starts happening, and they're like, okay, yeah, you're right. And they go to fight the tall man. It's, it's very, you know, like, nightmare logic. It's, it's a very dreamlike horror movie. Um, clearly, clearly very influential on, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. All the way down to its... Confusing as all hell ending. Because it's a dream, but it's also not a dream. Which is a twist I actually kind of hate. I hated it in uh, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. I hate it a little less in Phantasm. It fits the vibe of Phantasm a little more than it does Nightmare on Elm Street. Because Nightmare on Elm Street, like, it has some weird moments in the dream world, but it's not... Like a surrealist horror film. This is pretty surreal. So I can kind of give the ooh, was it a nightmare or wasn't it thing a pass in Phantasm more than I really would Nightmare on Elm Street. Although Nightmare on Elm Street's a better movie. Um, as much as I love Phantasm, my love of Phantasm is... Maybe a touch ironic, you know. There's like there's genuine stuff too. There's genuine stuff I like about this movie, but there's also a little ironic, like oh, this is so strange. This is so weird that uh, yeah, it's it's a tad of an ironic attachment. Like I I will freely admit that. Objectively, Nightmare on Elm Street is a better movie. Um, even though, uh, you know, I, I, <laughs> I feel like I'm a little more enthusiastic to talk about Phantasm because, uh, you know, it's, it's not nearly as popular. It is pretty popular. A lot of people have talked about Phantasm. It is considered a bit of like a horror movie classic, but um, I, I just really enjoy it and... I love discussing it. It's such it's such a fun little movie. Um I I have 
all five Phantasm movies here, um, at least all five that have been released, I w we will definitely be revisiting the franchise. I'm definitely going to recommend two and maybe three. Say so I, I actually think three is a little better than two, but I'll, I'll probably recommend two and three. I don't know about four and five. Four is sort of the bad one. Not... Not less enjoyable, I'll say that much. It is It is in no way less enjoyable than the first three, but it is definitely much more poorly made than the first three. As I, I made a joke on Twitter that uh, Neil Breen needs to remake Phantasm IV because it, it is very Neil Breen-esque. You know, it's this weird, trippy movie. Most of it takes place in the desert, and the acting is terrible. I can't explain that. It's the same actors from the other three movies. They're just way worse in the fourth movie. And the fifth movie, I like. There's good stuff about it. But it's it's kind of a disappointing ending. Mostly because it wasn't supposed to be the ending. They had, like, a final script called Phantasm's End. And they just, they never could get the money to make Phantasm's End. Which is unfortunate, because it sounds fucking awesome. I, I've, I've heard the plot description of it, and it sounds amazing. Uh, but they, they never could get the money up for it, so they made the fifth one over the course of, like, ten years with whatever money they could scrape together. Because it, it started as, like, a short film... And then they kept expanding on it and expanding on it and expanding on it. And then, they, like, they combined it with another short film. And so, the fifth movie, it, it's a bit of a mishmash. But it's it's interesting. I like it. But it, it shouldn't be the end of the Phantasm franchise. Unfortunately, uh, Angus Scrim, who plays the tall man, uh, has passed away. And I don't know if you could make a Phantasm movie without Angus Scrim. Um, it would be difficult. It'd be very difficult. And you could try reintegrating him in, like, like take unused footage and maybe, like, I don't know, a little bit of deep fakery and put him into a fifth Phantasm movie. Because, you know, he he's the villain. It's not like he has a lot of screen time. He just sort of shows up to be intimidating, but I, I feel like it would maybe be... It, it would be an uphill battle to make a good Phantasm movie without Angus Scrim. I'm not opposed to it, though. If, if a sixth Phantasm comes out, I will go see it. Just because I love this franchise. And I like Don Coscarelli, who, who directed uh, four of the five movies, and helped direct the fifth movie, even if he's not the credited director. Um, he also made um, Beastmaster. I love Beastmaster. And he made John Dies at the end, which is really great. Um, also Bubba Hotep, which I have not seen. But it's on the docket for movie nights. I, I'm going to show Bubba Hotep before the year is out. Yeah, Angus Scrim just brings so much to the tall man. I mean, <laughs> he's a tall, tall dude already. And then they kind of, they have him up on, like, platform shoes. And they gave him, like, a suit size too small. So it would, l like, his suit doesn't fit quite right. So he looks even bigger. <laughs> and and he's just... Amazing. <laughs> Like, like one of the best horror villains in, in, in any horror movie. Angus Scrim as the tall man just, like, lumbering around and saying, Boy! That's the reason to watch these movies. Like, if even if you're not gonna enjoy, like, the weird psychedelic stuff, at the very least, watch the first one to see Angus Scrim be the tall man. I've talked for a long time about this, and I, I feel like I still haven't really said that much. I guess there's a lot to talk about with Phantasm. Um, then again, I, I have dipped into the franchise a little, and I do want to come back to this franchise, so... 
I guess I guess I'll wrap it up. Um, in conclusion, watch Phantasm. It's a great movie. Yeah, we'll leave it. Just just leave it. Who cares? Um, up next, we watched The Ice Cream Man. A uh, horror comedy from the early 90s starring uh, Clint Howard. Clint Howard. How can your movie be bad if it has Clint Howard in it? At the very least, the scenes with Clint Howard and them will be good. So, The Ice Cream Man is about these... Uh, three kids who, uh, like, like, they're really close friends, and they discover that the new ice cream man that has moved into town is, like, kidnapping and killing children, and, like, a lot of his ice cream is made using, like, human parts, which is weird. Y y you get that a little with, you know, uh, the, the... Sweeney Todd, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre type stuff where they're, you know, uh, Soylent Green, where they're, like, grinding up humans and using them as meat. Like, human meat is, is the meat they use for, like, their barbecue or whatever. Human parts in ice cream? I don't know if that's gonna go down quite as well. Apparently it does, though, in this movie. He even, like, he, like, scoops out part of an eyeball. And j first off, he scoops out part of an eyeball and it's solid white. And I'm like, no, eyeballs are full of blood. That wouldn't work. But he, he scoops out a part of an eyeball and it's just, like, white. And he sticks it in his rocky road. And it's like, shouldn't people be able to tell that that's not a marshmallow? I don't think eyeballs taste anything like marshmallows. But I mean, you know, <laughs> there's a degree to which you can't really nitpick too much, because it is a comedy movie that's part of the joke. The joke is he's using humans to make ice cream. And, and Clint Howard's character has this whole tragic backstory where, like, uh, when, when he was, like, a little, little kid, um, the ice cream man in his town, who was the ice cream king, uh, he got gunned down by gangsters right in front of Clint Howard's character, and so he, he goes to this, like, mental institution because he, he's, it seems like he was a little unstable already, and then he sees the ice cream man die, and he's, like, really emotionally affected by that. So his mother sends him to this mental institution, but it's not, like, a real mental institution. It's just, like, a crazy guy doing crazy experiments on crazy people. And so they inject him with this, like, weird experimental medicine... And, and they come in and feed him ice cream every day. And they're like, every day is a happy day. We're going to be happy all the time. Uh, and, and just happiness and ice cream every day. So, you know, th that's, that's what leads him to grow up to be this, like, demented, murderous ice cream man. Um, and he, he kidnaps you know, one of the kids, uh, like, the three main characters' friend. It's, there's four of them. They're the Rocketeers, but he kidnaps one of them, and the other three are, like, trying to get him back, and they're, they're all pretty sure he's dead at some point, even though he is still alive, and, and he's training this new kid to be the next ice cream man. So, yeah, it's, it's fun. It's silly. It's, uh... Very tongue-in-cheek. It knows what it's doing. I mean, it's it's Clint Howard as a killer ice cream man. There's, there's a degree to which you can't take that seriously. I am given to understand the original script was a lot more comedic, but I don't know. This is pretty silly anyways, so... Uh, I, I enjoyed it pretty well. Um, <laughs> like... I'm not, I'm not gonna act like it's good or anything, 
but it it knows what it is, and it's not trying to be anything more, so I, I, I gotta give it points, you know? It's charming. It's a fun little movie. I, I love the, like, there's, like, a police who, who, like, asks to check inside Clint Howard's ice cream truck, and as soon as he comes in, Clint Howard takes a waffle iron and just waffle irons his face, which is amazing. And then later in the movie, he he's like, ooh, I got a special treat for you, and he holds up a, uh, an ice cream cone, and it's got the guy's head on it, which is just fucking amazing. The one disappointment I have is, like, because it, it's about him killing children, right? That's the main idea. The, the ice cream man is killing children. But throughout the movie, he only kills one child. And it's, it's like, off-screen at the beginning of the movie. Everyone else he kills is an adult. And it's like, ah, uh, that's, that's kind of lame. Give me more child murder. That's what I want in movies. More child murder. Actually, all three of these movies, where we're about to get to the stuff, all three of these are very child-centric. Um, in Phantasm, you have, you know, Mike poking around. Mike's the only one that knows that, uh, you know, uh, the, the tall man is stealing bodies. In this one, the kids are the only ones that know... Uh, the ice cream man is killing children, and then in the stuff, there's a little kid, and he's, like, the only person in his family who realizes the stuff is bad. He's he's one of only, like, a handful of people who realize that you shouldn't eat the stuff. So, yeah, very child-centric night. It's all children discovering secrets. Which, granted, I guess is kind of a horror trope. It's just interesting that the three ice cream horror movies I decided to show together would all be about children discovering a secret and no one believing them. Nice Vinegar Syndrome release. I think this was a really early release from them. Um, but it includes um, the episode of uh, Joe Bob's Summer School with Clint Howard which features the amazing bit of trivia that, uh, to, to get his, like, raspy voice, the raspy voice he has in this movie, Clint Howard would scream the whole way into work, like, driving from his house to the set, he would just scream. And I love the image. <laughs> I, I just love imagining Clint Howard driving down, like, the L.A. freeway, screaming his brains out and just like these other characters these other drivers like is that ron howard's brother just fucking screaming in his car ah oh, clint howard gotta love him um probably my favorite of the howards although bryce dallas howard is a lot prettier um i was kind of surprised I, like, like, Howard is a common enough name that when I found out Bryce Dallas Howard was Ron Howard's daughter, I'm like, oh, huh, okay. I thought she was just totally different Howard, but no, she's Bryce Dallas Howard of Ron and Clint Howard. This, this might be Clint Howard's best performance. I don't know. <laughs> like, I like Clint Howard, um, but... He he doesn't have a huge range. I mean, he was a child star for a while. I think he he voices either Piglet or Rue in, like, the original Winnie the Pooh movie. Um, the Mini Adventures of Winnie the Pooh. He's in the Mini Adventures of Winnie the Pooh as, like, a small, small child. But, uh, basically after Evil Speak, it was all just, like, creepy dude. That's who Clint Howard is. Clint Howard is the creepy dude. Um, and I, he, he does show a lot of range in this movie. Uh, a little more range than he usually shows in his appearances. Although, to be fair, a lot of his appearances are showing up and saying, like, two lines in a Ron Howard movie. <laughs> he's in, uh, I, uh... He's in Solo, A Star Wars Story for, like, two seconds. 
Um, but he's in uh, The Grinch Who Stole Christmas. He's... Is he the mayor in Grinch Who Stole Christmas? Maybe. Maybe. And he's also in uh, the live-action Cat in the Hat movie, which is proof that Cat in the Hat is not that bad, because Clint Howard is in it. As for the kids in this movie, I they're decent enough child actors, except one of them is supposed to be, like, the fat kid. That's the joke. He's the fat kid. But it's clearly just a, a skinny kid with a pillow shoved up his shirt. And it's like... Why would you not just cast a fat kid? Is there a shortage of fat kids? The Goonies had a... F just get the kid from the Goonies! Get the fat kid from the Goonies to be in this movie. Uh, <laughs> like, this, there's no shortage of fat kids willing to be in movies. Why would you just pick a skinny kid and put a pillow up his shirt? I'm... <laughs> I, I, I don't know, I feel like maybe I'm weirdly more bothered by, like, the casting of fat characters than I should be. Because this is not the first time I have said, just cast a fat person as the fat person, okay? If you're going to have a fat character in your movie, just cast someone fat! There's no shortage of fat people out there. And especially if it's just going to be a kid. Like, who gives a shit? Like... Because I, I, I made fun of this in, like, Switchblade Sisters, right? They had the the fat chick who was still, like, pretty conventionally attractive. That I kind of get, because you want the girls to all be pretty. Look at all the pretty girls, even the fat one's pretty. In this, it's kids. I don't care what the kids look like. I'm not attracted to children. Finally, we watched... Larry Cohen's The Stuff. I can't believe this is the first Larry Cohen movie I've shown. I guess... I don't know. I guess that checks out. God damn, I love Larry Cohen. <sighs> Put a pen in it. With, I should... I, I'm gonna have to... Just, I'm gonna describe the plot of the movie, and then we can talk about how good Larry Cohen is. So, The Stuff, which is not quite an ice cream movie, but I figured close enough... It's actually a little closer to that, like, uh, like, like, not Stay Puff. Stay Puff is the fake one from Ghostbusters. The, hold on, I have a jar of it. Jet Puffed. Not, not Stay Puff. Jet Puffed. The, the Jet Puffed Marshmallow Cream, which I bought some of after watching the stuff because it made me want some. I'm like, oh man, give me that, like, marshmallow cream stuff. Mmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a little more like marshmallow cream than ice cream, but uh, it, it is a major plot point in the movie that, like, the stuff is overtaking ice cream in popularity, and there's, like, an ice cream co company that's trying to figure out the secret ingredients to the stuff so they can make their own version of the stuff. But the trick is, the stuff is just... Like, this weird ooze that comes up from the earth. It's 100% natural. There are no ingredients to it. Um, but apparently it tastes really sweet and really delicious. And if you eat too much of it, the stuff takes over your body. Because the stuff is alive. It's like a, a weird sentient creature. <laughs> like, it's... It's like The Thing, if The Thing was ice cream. Uh, so, so you know, people start eating the stuff be because, you know, it's addictive, it takes over your mind, it's like... I th they never say it's like an alien or anything, it, ju it just comes up from the ground, so... Maybe we're dealing with, like, a society situation where it seems like an alien, but it's actually just something from Earth. But the stuff gets really popular because, you know, it takes over people's minds if you eat too much. But also, like, it's apparently a really sweet, tasty snack that's, like, low in calories and fat and has, like, a lot of nutritional value to it. Um, which does make it kind of freaky because, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I... I think if I lived in this universe, I would probably also get addicted to the stuff. That's 
that just seems like me. That seems like something I would do. <laughs> like, I, I really like food. I really like eating. So I'd probably eat a lot of the stuff. Well, there's this ice cream company, and they hire this one guy to, like, go out and investigate what the stuff is made of, and that leads him down, you know, the rabbit hole to the, the conspiracy at the core of the stuff. And along the way, he starts working with um, the woman who did the advertisements for the stuff. She, like, kind of helps him get in. And at first, he's, he's, like, lying to her so he can, like, find out the secret ingredients. But at some point, he's like, hey, there's a real problem with the stuff. And she's like, yeah, I noticed. So then they're working together to take down the stuff. And they team up with this kid who, like... He, he saw the stuff moving around in his refrigerator, and he's like, Hmm, that's a problem. I shouldn't eat that. But, of course, at that point, like, his whole family's addicted, and they're like, Ooh, come on, you gotta eat some. Eat some. That's all we're eating in this family now is the stuff. And then uh, they they have to, like, take down this whole big corporation and at some point, because uh, the guy who has been hired by the ice cream company is former FBI, and he he gets in contact with this guy who used to know who is this like like weird uh <laughs> like like libertarian militant leader like he's got his own little militia of people like ready in case the commies attack and uh this guy the the ice cream company guy shows up and is just like hey uh there's this commie food that's affecting everyone's minds and the guy's like ah commies let's go fight them and he takes his like private militia and destroys the company that makes the stuff <laughs> which is just it's it's one of the most bizarre sequences. I I love it. And and oh man, the fucking the the general guy he goes to talk to has such good dialogue. Uh Larry Cohen's so good at writing dialogue. <laughs> Larry Cohen's a, a good director. He's he's interesting. There's a weird cadence to dialogue in a Larry Cohen film that, like, you wouldn't pick up on if you'd only seen, like, one or two, but if you've seen a few Larry Cohen movies, you're like, oh, I can tell kind of right off that Larry Cohen directed this because of the way people talk. Um, and it is a little less severe in the stuff than some of his other movies. Um, I really love... Uh, it's alive. It's alive. The dialogue is really, really Larry Cohen. <laughs> uh, but I, I really like It's Alive. We're definitely gonna watch It's Alive. Probably the whole trilogy. I have all three back here. The It's Alive trilogy. Coming down, cu coming your way in the future. I don't know how far in the future. Um, I love that. I also love, um, Private Files of J. Edgar Hoover, which is, like, one of his most dramatic movies. Larry Cohen typically does, like, horror. Um, but he did, he did this biopic about J. Edgar Hoover, and it's, it's really fascinating and really good. And, <laughs> in fact, in this movie, the, uh, former FBI agent mentions to someone that he used to work for J. Edgar Hoover, and I'm like, ah, so this is a stealth sequel to Private Files of J. Edgar Hoover. I see you, Larry Cohen. Um, yeah, really interesting director, a lot of really good movies. <laughs> um, among them, honestly, the stuff. I enjoyed the stuff. <laughs> like... I've I have heard some negative things about the stuff, and I totally get it, but... Mostly what I hear about the stuff is it's really enjoyable in spite of all the bad things. And yes, yes, it is a really fun movie in spite of all of the flaws it has. I just, it's just, 
you, how can you not have a good time with this movie, right? Like, it's it's a good time start to... All three of these, all three of these are just, like, fun time movies. Phantasm, I'll give a little more credit. Phantasm, I think, is, like, a genuinely good movie. But all three of these are just such a fun time. It's like... How can you hate on them? How can you hate on these movies? They're brilliant. They're hilarious. I love them. I love Ice Cream Man. I love the stuff. Uh, both both recommended by me. This is one of the best triple features I've done. <laughs> I am very proud of this triple feature. I, I was looking into it, and it seems there is actually one other ice cream horror movie. There's a movie called, like, The Ice Cream Truck from, like, 2015. But I have never seen it, I've never heard anything about it, and I guarantee it's not as good as any of these three movies. So, uh, we're not gonna watch The Ice Cream Truck, probably. You know, unless, unless all of a sudden, like, I don't know, if, like, Vinegar Syndrome does a release of it and suddenly everyone's like, Whoa, Undiscovered Jim, The Ice Cream Truck. Then maybe I'll hop on the bandwagon, but... Mm, no. No, no, not unless, not unless I hear a lot of really good stuff about it, and I haven't heard anything about it, so. Last time I asked you, what's like a summer movie to you? Um, and I guess my answer to this would be like a lot of the early Pixar movies. Because starting with Monsters, Inc., I believe, Monsters, Inc. came out in the summer... And then every summer, Pixar would release another movie, right? So, so like, Monsters, Inc., Nemo, uh, The Incredibles, Cars. I'm missing one. There's one between Finding Nemo and The Incredibles, I think. I think? No? No, I think that's it. I think those that's the order it goes in. Um, hmm... Like, I feel like there's another one between them, but the fact that I can't think of what it is makes me think that maybe there isn't. But anyways, uh, you know, the Pixar movies would come out every summer, and I would always go to see them with my family. Plus, you know, summer, I'm, like, home from school, I'm spending a lot of time in front of the TV, and that means re-watching Pixar movies continuously on a loop. I just... I I watched the early movies of Pixar so many times I can't even count. <laughs> like, uh, uh, someone, uh, Lino, I think it was Lino, tagged me on Twitter for like, a, oh, five movies you've seen more than five times. And I, I included Monsters, Inc., but I could include Toy Story, Toy Story 2, Bugs Life, Finding Nemo, all of them I just watched on constant repeat as a child. <laughs> so those those are like summer movies to me, you know? Movies I would watch when I'm home from school. There was always a new one every summer. So the those are my summer movies. Henry Koslick mentions um, the second Adam's Family movie. Um, Adam's Family Values, I think it's called? He just says the Adams Family movie where they go to summer camp, which I don't believe I have ever seen. If I did, I was really young when I watched it. Um, I did just rewatch the first Adams Family movie not too long ago, and I, I did really enjoy it. I'm like, I I wish the plot was a little better, but I really like the the way they wrote the Adams Family. They they really know what makes the Adams Family work in that movie. Um, so I, I would be very interested to watch the sequel. Um, <laughs> yeah, with Wednesday and Pugsley at summer camp, that's, that sounds very interesting. There was, there was also, like, a third one, but no one liked it, and it didn't have any of the original actors. <laughs> um, I don't know, good, good answer. Uh, Chewy Chips mentions, um, The Town That Dreaded Sundown. And says, uh, when he was a kid, uh, 
I was a kid, would visit Grandpa's farm in rural Virginia. There were hardly any street lights, and the houses were far apart, and when night fell, you couldn't see a thing. Uh, so there was no AC, so we slept with the windows open. And someone kept showing the town that dreaded sundown on TV. <laughs> so he, he was constantly freaked out about someone just coming through the open windows. Um, says... Uh, I had to be six or seven, so I feel like a six or seven year old shouldn't be watching Town That Dreaded Sundown, <laughs> um, especially if you're in like way out in the boonies, where where Town That Dreaded Sundown takes place. Yeah, yeah, that that would probably freak me out too. I get you. I feel you. Um, I haven't seen Town the Dreaded Sundown. That's like, that's near the top of my list. I, I've seen a lot of slasher movies, and for some reason, that is one I just have not gotten to. So, uh, unfortunately, I can't comment on the film, but it's a good story. I like the story. Thank you for sharing that with us. So, it's uh, it's Band Films Week, um, but last year I already asked what your favorite band movie was. So this year. I want to ask a little more personal question because it ties into a video I'm working on right now. What was a movie or TV show, you, you can include TV shows, that your parents just wouldn't let you watch as a kid? This was like banned in your household. No one's watching, you know, this movie. And I mean like something very specific, not like, oh, this is an R-rated movie, you're Seven, you can't watch an R-rated movie. I mean, like, this movie is for children, but it's off-limits to you. So tonight we're, we're doing uh, a band film's triple feature, starting with one of my favorite movies just, just ever. Just one of my favorite movies ever, let alone one of my favorite band movies. Ken Russell's The Devils. I, I love it so much. Uh, I, I did talk about it last time. It's not an easy movie to find, legally. Behind that, we're gonna watch Baby Doll, because it's a movie that was banned in the U.S. that I haven't seen. I, I might regret this decision. <laughs> I might really regret this decision, but... Baby Doll is my second recommendation, and we're gonna end with the ever-classic Freaks. From Todd Browning. The only one I have a physical copy of. And it's a DVD. Because there's no Blu-ray release of this. Nor of the... Well, there might be one of Baby Doll. I didn't check. So that's that's our band movies triple feature this year. Uh, uh, none of them were Video Nasties. So last year I did Video Nasties. This year it's three movies that were just banned... For completely different reason. I, I almost feel like I need to push, uh, like, like, event movie nights up a week. Because I'm showing the three banned movies tonight because it's banned films week. But I'll, I won't be talking about them for two weeks. So two weeks from now you can hear me talk about the banned movies I'm showing for Band Films Week. But whatever. It's my show. I'll do what I want. I actually don't know what I'm going to recommend next time because I had a triple feature planned, including Flesh for Frankenstein, but literally right before I sat down to record, I saw a tweet from someone at Vinegar Syndrome announcing Vinegar Syndrome is going to be doing a 4K release of Flesh for Frankenstein, which is one of my favorite movies, and I'm like, hmm, I might want to hold out and get, like, the nice special edition Flesh for Frankenstein, because the one I have is a British import, and it has no bonus features. So... I might go ahead and do the Flesh for Frankenstein triple feature, but I might hold out on showing... The other two movies I was going to include with it until I have the special edition version from Vinegar Syndrome. 
We'll see. I might be moving the schedule around. Until then, though, happy Band Films Week. <laughs> <laughs>